uh, Elon, you're with the Congress of Neurosurgeons, and as I uh, was just sharing with the group, I um, really enjoyed um, our time together recently. And I thought for those um, who hadn't had an opportunity to work um, and, and be exposed to Neuralink's technology, you could just share a little bit um, about your founder story and, and what uh, made you interested in, in bringing computer interface in the first place. Sure. Um, well, uh, this is going to sound somewhat esoteric um, and maybe a, a, you know, a bit strange, but uh, I was actually trying to figure out how to mitigate the risk of digital superintelligence. Um, and the, it, I mean, to the degree that, that we can improve our, our bandwidth to our digital tertiary self, um, I think we can better align um, artificial intelligence with um, a collective human will. Um, like I said, this is going to sound very strange, but um, so you, you can think of like basically uh, our intelligence is being divided into roughly three areas. There's sort of like a like a you know limbic system, like like like, like the sort of instinctual elements that the sort of like the, the cortex and the, the the planning part. But then we also have a tertiary layer, which is all the uh, computers and, and uh, phones, applications, software that we use. Um, so that you, you have a digital tertiary self. You're, basically, we're already an Android, uh, effectively. Um, and in fact, I think people feel this uh, when they forget their phone. It, it, you, it, forgetting your phone, leaving your phone behind is like having missing limb syndrome. You're like um, you're missing your, your <laughs> part of your digital tertiary element. Um, the, the constraint on um, human machine symbiosis is, however, is, is bandwidth. What is the, especially out, uh, output bandwidth? Uh, the output bandwidth of a human is less than one bit per second over the course of a day. So if you have 86,400 seconds in a day, the number of output bits that you produce, I mean, maybe there's some rare cases where it's above one bit per second, but you, very few people produce 86,400 output bits. Of, of you know, you know that's that's a rare situation. Um, so most people like are averaging less than one bit per second over a twenty-four hour period, and when we do speak, the they say the number of symbols per second of speech or um, typing you know, is is quite low, especially if it's going through a phone. Then you you know, you've got your you just sort of have two slow moving meat sticks um, that are trying to type letters on a phone. Um, so you really have just a few, you know, taps per second of of characters. So your your, your phone is like sitting there, and your your phone is like a supercomputer in your you know, in your hands, and uh, it is desperately trying to figure out what you what what you want to say. Yeah, well, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I've personally experienced that phantom limb syndrome when I actually can't find my phone, and I hadn't thought of myself um, as a cyborg until you challenged me to think that way. But you're um, in a room um, of folks who've devoted their lives to neurologic disease, and, and I must confess to you that I had never actually thought of the output of the brain in terms of bits per second. Um, but when you frame it that way, yeah. um, it makes it um, really clear why there may be a, a broader opportunity um, to make that that virtual cyborg that we have now with our phone, um, a little bit more efficient. So, so that's um, as a starting point. What what prompted yeah. your interest um, uh, in Neuralink? Yeah. So, um, basically, I, I I thought, okay, if, if we're if we're gonna have, in in order to have better um, human AI symbiosis, um, we must solve the bandwidth problem below a certain. Um, bandwidth, we are basically just stationary to a computer. Um, and uh, it, it, at one bit per second, you know, that's, that's, very, that's a very low data, data rate when, when computers are doing trillions of bits per second. So when you think about brain-machine yeah. interface, um, why, why did you select the technical approach you did? I, I know a lot of thought's gone into that. Yeah, so, well, if, if, if you say, like, okay, we need to have ultimately um, a million bits per second, or a, a billion bits per second, gigabit per second um, interface, then that means you, you really, you, you can't uh, becoming, you, you need an implant. You, 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 and ultimately, we'll need to replace like the skull, and it's gonna be a zillion wire. I mean, this is some sci-fi, bizarre sci-fi stuff, and I'm not, 
this is certainly optional, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's good. Man um, mandatory replacement of my skull would have a problem. Mandatory chip and brain is not what we're saying here for sure. Um, but uh, at a certain point, you, you, you say like, okay, in order, how, how many electrodes are needed in order to interface with, with have a whole brain interface? Yeah, you know, I, I've heard you mention that that uh, larger goal of whole brain interface. Um, but one thing that's really struck me by, by the approach that's been taken is, I, I think as neurosurgeons, we often uh, contemplate the natural history of the disease and competing risk and benefit. And, and Neuralink, um, a, as a company, has started with folks who have ALS and spinal cord injury, yeah. these kind of first, first steps in terms of technical approach. So, so we'd absolutely. love to hear um, a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so long-term goal, um, like I said, is, is, is a, Mitigating civilizational risk associated with a divergence of biological and digital intelligence. That's the long-term goal. Obviously, then you've got to parse that into, like, well, what are we going to do tomorrow? Yeah. Um, so the, the starting point um, with the, the first Neuralink device is uh, 1,000 electrodes. Um, and we've, uh, with, with, uh, with, with, with just 100, if, if only 100 of those electrodes are active, if you take, say, our, our first a few patients, you know, we're getting, we, we're, we are setting world records. I'm, admittedly, these are world records that are pretty low. Um, but we're getting, um, you know, around 10 bits per second. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's, there's a path to, you know, a, a, a thousand bits per second, um, which would be literally a hundred times more than the next record. Um, so we want to do the implants in w where there's the highest gain um, and the least risk. Uh, so that's, uh, um, so we call the first implant uh, telepathy, which really just um, it's interfacing with the motor cortex, and uh, you know, and it's, it's basically looking at signals as though somebody moved their arm, and, and just re reading that signal, and then sending that signal to the to the um, patient's phone or computer, so they can then um, move the cursor around just by thinking. Um, yeah. And um, if, if people have seen the videos of Noland, uh, it's pretty impressive what he can do. Um, in fact, shortly after getting the implant, he, he spent all night playing video games uh, just by thinking. Yeah, um, and, and those are the records you're talking about in those first two prime yeah. patients where you're able to extract signals from their brain at, at, yeah. at record bits per second and, and yeah. enable them to work um, in the world as, as uh, those of us who lose their phone um, would use today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll actually, we're, we'll get to the point pretty quickly where um, someone with a Neuralink implant will outperform somebody who's using their hands to play a video game. What, what do you um, think the timeline for that is? We won't hold you to it. Sure. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I, I do have a habit of being optimistic with respect to timelines. Um, but if I, if I wasn't optimistic, I wouldn't be starting these companies, probably. Yeah, yeah. that's um, fair. So, um, but I, I think given that we're already pretty much at a point where we're pretty close to on par with the, the video game, basically you can play a video game at a comparable level to someone with hands. I think um, with our second generation device, uh, which will have 3000 electrodes and we'll, we'll get a lot better at, at placing those electrodes. Um, so I think we'll, we'll have, you know, for our first device, we're in the first, First patient, we had like a 10%, roughly 10% yield. Uh, so only it's only 100 electrodes being being effective. Um, so we'll both improve the yield and we'll increase the number of electrodes. So we'll go from say 100 electrodes that are reading to I don't know out of 3,000 electrodes, maybe 15 and half. So like 1,500 are reading. So yeah. at that point, the data rate is far in excess of what someone playing a video game with their hands could do, um, and we can um, reduce the latency. So the Really, the moment you think of a move, it, it happens instantly on the computer, um, as opposed to what you know. You, you, it, currently, if you, if you play a video game, you have to like move your hand. So that, that's like you've got to send signals to the muscles. The muscles have to move. The, the, your, your finger takes a certain amount of time to move. So you, you've got to you basically got to move the meat puppet. Yeah, <laughs> so you know, I, I have puppet. to say when, when you're. <laughs> When it's you're, slow moving puppet, um, and, and, and if you don't have to move, if you don't have to move, actuate the muscles in your hand, um, and and because you know your fingers can move at a certain you know a certain rate and set, you know, like millimeters per second, 
but if you don't have to do any of that, you can literally think it immediately with no latency. You'll outperform someone who has to use a hand. Yeah, you know, it, it's I think funny. it's been a couple of years, basically. No, I, I think as surgeons, we really take pride in being efficient and using our hand. But when you're a reductionist like that, it actually makes me feel like I'm actually not particularly efficient. <laughs> if you could just, if you could just think and yeah. do it, I think I'd probably get a lot. I'll get a lot more done. You know, one of the things that struck me in terms of the technical approach is obviously you have the implant and then you're extracting those signals and have a recording algorithm and then you're actually affecting uh, an action. And, you know, in one of the patients, you actually had um, a, a lead retraction, but then were able to tune the recording algorithm um, to actually recover that function. And, and could you maybe yeah. say a little bit about that kind of vertically integrated approach and how that's going to let you scale a little bit? Sure. Um well, since, you know, really none of this stuff existed before, we had to design and build everything from, from scratch. Um, and, I mean, it, the, the, the device, it's basically like having, like, an Apple Watch or a Fitbit that replaces a piece of skull, and then you've got these electrodes, very, very fine electrodes, uh, that uh, are impl implanted with a surgical robot. Maybe you can share. You okay. maybe can share a little bit about um, a little bit about the the robot, the the R one yeah. robot that's used to implant the threads. Yeah. So the, the threads are are really too small to be manipulated by hand, and it's, and and they, they need to be placed with with extreme precision very quickly. Um, so and, and you, obviously you've got the, the the brain is moving all the time due to uh, breathing and heartbeat and just. Uh, it's not just as you, as you as you guys know. It's not just sitting there. It's like it's like a pulsing thing. So and you're trying to get an electrode to a specific depth, while this this you know jello balloon is is just moving around all over the place. Um, so it's 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 kind of an impossible, really an impossible thing to do by hand. These these yeah. threads are just too tiny, um, and the level of precision required is beyond what people can do. Uh, I maybe liken it to be being similar to. Um, computer-controlled machining um, or uh, you know, a 3D metal printing with, where you've got a laser welding tiny bits of metal dust. It's just, there's just no way that uh, humans just not, do not have the level of precision necessary uh, to, to implant the electrodes um, uh, you know, to fractions of a millimeter uh, of, of XYZ position. Yeah, but the, yeah. the, ro the robot can. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, as a, a group of surgeons, many of us at, to varying stages have incorporated robotics into our practice. Uh, when you hear a uh, precision um, uh, exceeding uh, human capacity, you think, is this uh, going to be a, a disruption or is this an augmentation um, to what surgeons do? And, and I know you have um, some thoughts around that, you know, and there's some maybe yeah. some, some analogies in ophthalmology. So we'd love to hear that, that perspective. Yeah. Um, so. I think the ophthalmology analogy is the is the right one. Where with with LASIK, um, you've got uh, an ophthalmologist will oversee I don't know perhaps a half a dozen or a dozen um, LASIK machines, um, and um, you know just make sure the machine is is, is the yeah. patient getting the right operation in the, in the correct eye, uh, and uh, is the is the is the is the machine operating properly. Um, but thereafter, the, you know, the patient will sit in the laser chair, and the the, the robot's going to basically laser your eyeball. Yeah. Um, and now, now this is much better than someone uh, getting a hand laser and and la hand lasering your eyeball, <laughs> which would be, um, you know, have varying results. I think it's some, it'll be something similar to LASIK, where you have perhaps a neurosurgeon overseeing um, half a dozen or a dozen um, of the Neuralink. Um, uh, robots that are, are doing the, the implants and just obviously making sure it's the right implant in the right location for the right purpose and that everything's okay with the, with the patient. Um, so it would be like a, a massive amplification. Um, I, I think it, and, and it, it's kind of necessary that it be a massive amplification because um, there simply are not enough neurosurgeons to do this all by hand. It's like physically impossible. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're talking about ultimately, um, you know, uh, doing tens of millions of these things. Like maybe there's 8 billion people in the world. I don't know, maybe at least a few billion are going to want this, maybe more. So then how do you, how do you get a, like literally billions of devices? Yeah. Uh, unless, unless you got the robots, it's, it's not happening.
Yeah, so yeah, I've heard you frame uh, the introduction of the robot as not just a, a precision in, uh, issue, but an interest of, of workforce and scale. And there's obviously you know, a little over 3,000 um, of us nationally, so that would be um, a little bit challenging. Uh, can yeah. you share a little bit in kind of this early journey um, uh, with BCI what, what some of the challenges um, have been? What, what you've encountered technically. Um, I, I know obviously the, 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 bio, the biological environment, the salt water problem is very hostile. I, Things with uh, energy transfer. Indeed. Would love to hear your, your thoughts on that and how, you're, how your team's uh, taking those things on. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, as, as everyone, I'm obviously talking to people that, that in fact know a lot more about the brain and have, <laughs> that, 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 than I do. Um, but I, I've certainly come to uh, understand more than most people, um, the so the challenge is you've got you've got a device that's going to live there for years. Um, it's an electrical device that has to transmit uh, radio, essentially, you know, has to transmit photons to a computer. Uh, it's subcutaneous. Um, it's it's got to be charged. Uh, it's got it's got electrodes that are reading and writing. So it's it's not like it can't just be uh, electrically isolated. Uh, in fact, you, you, you're fighting two things. You, you want you you really are desperately trying to read these neurons, but you also don't want to be corroded. <laughs> so it's like it's a very difficult thing to yeah. have just just the minimum amount of insulation necessary to not be corroded, but not be so insulated that you can't hear the neurons. Uh, so uh, you know, so so there's a it's a very challenging materials problem. Um, and with our latest uh, uh, electrodes, there'll be silicon carbide coated. But but even like silicon carbide is a very difficult material to work with. But it's it's awesome, but it's very difficult. And you've got to make sure the coating is is extremely precise. It's it's got to be uh, you know can't be too thin or too thick anywhere. Um, it's got to be very evenly uh, you know um, applied to the threads. Um, so so I, I, it's the sheer number of iterations necessary to actually have this device be uh, you know hermetically sealed uh, um, and survive in the body and and, and not you know uh, fail in some way but, but and, and then have uh, the, have it be able to transmit uh, to your phone or computer uh, at a high data rate without uh, running down the battery um, is, is it's very difficult. I'd say there's many, many technical challenges in that. So I, I mean, I do have slightly trivial, trivialized by saying it's sort of like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch in your brain. Um, but the, but if you actually put those things in your brain, your, neither your brain nor the Apple Watch or Fitbit would be happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> to be would not be a good situation. So so this feels um, like the right place to to ask. I think one of the more interesting questions um, we received. So. Um, as someone who's in a, a position of authority to comment on both, can you settle the age-old question, what, what's actually more difficult, brain surgery or rocket science? Well, they're both, they're both quite challenging. It's bizarre that I'm involved in both. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, I think they're, they're, they're of, of similar magnitude of difficulty, um, especially so the story, when- So the story checks out. <laughs> yes. I think I think nobody's out there thinking. You know what's easy? Brain surgery and rockets. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for backing thinking, us up. We appreciate it. Yeah, 100. percent No, that's uh, legit. Um, brain surgery is super hard, and rockets are super hard. And there's a reason that they're idiomatic expressions. This is no accident. Um, so yeah, very difficult, um, especially as you try to scale the electrodes, number of electrodes, um, and, and I, I, I don't. We don't know how to get, say so like ultimately get to say, how do we do a million electrodes? This is, we don't know that, how to do that yet, except that hopefully it is physically possible. If, if you want to have a high band with a whole brain interface, um, then I think probably the right order of magnitude is, is something like a million electrodes. Um, and that, that still has a very high ratio of neurons to electrodes. So that means you've got to read, you know, you try to like any given, Electrode has to be able to read neurons from, you know, several, like like I don't know, a hundred or a thousand neurons. So if you if you can do, if you've got a million electrodes and they can do, and each electrode can read a thousand neurons, so you've got a billion access to a billion neurons. Just a little, not that high actually. Yeah. Uh, but hope my hopefully high enough. 
Well, well, um, I, well I know the goal with um, a whole brain interface is this um, potential for long-term augmentation or symbiosis. But you know, in the more immediate term, something that we think a lot about as surgeons is how is technology going to allow us to treat problems that we aren't able to treat now? And, yeah. and there's this whole family um, of diseases, psychiatric conditions, um, neurodevelopmental yep. conditions, you know, folks who, who are neurodiverse, and neurodegenerative conditions um, like Alzheimer's. And so as we get a better picture um, of not just the structure of the brain, but, you know, for lack of a better term, the music of the brain, um, do yeah. you see those as intermediate steps? Would, lo would love to hear your perspective on it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think we should be able to solve any problem over time that um, that 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 is um, a result of you know um, a, 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 a if like if you think of the brain like a computer effectively like a circuit board or, or something like that you can say like if you were given a circuit board and there were some short circuits or um, some circuits that should be there but aren't there um, if if there's any missing if there are any circuits that that shouldn't be there. Uh, and, and, and some that, that are there but shouldn't, we, we can fix those. So basically, if, 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 it, if it's, it's like, it's kind of like fixing a circuit board. Uh, now, now, if the circuit board's all melted, um, okay, it's, it's gonna be hard to fix a melted circuit board. You can fix the circuit board with, with a, a few issues, uh, but you can't, you can't fix it if it's been melted. Um, but but I, the vast majority of, of diseases or, or issues, brain issues, um, I think are fixable with, neuro, with a Neuralink device. Um, it's it's a it's a fine grained uh, means of of reading and writing uh, electrical signals in the brain at, at, a, at a very at very very with high precision, and and so that means like if if there's say an electrical storm, some kind of epilepsy or something, you can you, you can interrupt that storm. Um, you, you can you know there's like if you can say like if there are a set of if there are a set of signals. Um, to read, like in the case of blindness, so that if somebody's lost their optic nerve or both eyes, uh, you, you can you can still stimulate the the uh, uh, the visual cortex uh, even with with if the you know if, if they lost both eyes and 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 the, and the it's it so 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 so, so basically if, if in any anything that is a function of, of signals in or out can if if, if that is the nature of the problem. It can be fixed ultimately with a Neuralink device. Yeah, well, I know you, uh, Neuralink just got um, FDA uh, breakthrough designation um, for blind sight. You know, a, a week and a half um, before this meeting. You know, one thing that I, I've heard you talk about that I thought was so interesting when I when I think about neurodiversity or neurodegenerative disease is this idea of um, imagine um, if uh, someone like uh, of the intellect of a Stephen Hawking was able to right. communicate more efficiently, how much more would society rich lar writ large have benefited from those insights? And so when Absolutely. I think of people with, with neurodiverse conditions, I always think that they have all, all of this amazing potential um, uh, to potentially be uh, unlocked and, and maybe this yeah, um, implant definitely. could be a, a digital bridge to that. Uh, absolutely. So I, I think it could help a lot of people, like really ultimately help tens of millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions of people. Um, and um, I should say also this potential going, going beyond the brain to like if somebody's got a, a sort of a spinal cord injury, mm -hmm. uh, that being able to transmit the signals. So, you know, like the ideal, I think what, you know, most people that have lost the connection between their brain and their body would like is to reanimate their body. Sure. You know, there are there are there are some approximations of that where you can animate, say, a robot suit or a, you know, a, a robot arm or something like that. But if I think most people, if you ask them, like, what would you prefer? Oh, I'd like my body to work again. Sure. Um, so so that you know, if if you if, if provided the the neurons are still kind of there, um, it's it should be it's it's certainly physically possible to uh, shunt the signals from the motor cortex past the the point where the damage has occurred. Um, to to the, the neurons that then interface with your muscles and your arms and legs. If you think of it just like an, an electrical and communication system, like if 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 you ha severed like some Ethernet cables, what would you do? Well, you bridge the signal. Okay, great. That we, the same thing can be done with the human body. Is yeah. bridge the electrical signals and the communication signals. So you, you've got sensors, sensors and actuators, and the signals. The bidirectional signals for sensors and actuators um, are being interrupted, and so if you shunt the signals, 
uh, you, you will be able to reanimate the body. One other issue that comes up with implants that you were mentioning are, are iPhones. Um, when you're committing someone to an implant, uh, obviously there's a whole issue around um, upgrades or um, the cycle yes, time upgrades. or iteration of technology. Yep. So can you maybe say a little bit about um, reversibility and, and how we should be thinking about these things as, as we enter an era where BCI will become more widespread? Yeah, so we, we do think upgrades are pretty important. Um, just as you, you would not want an iPhone 1 stuck in your head when there's an iPhone 16. Um, or whatever version of iPhone they're on these days, but I think it's like six. It's pretty high. I, I've lost track of what number they're on. I, I think um, you're. I think you're up to date on the sixteen. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, so so, but I, I mean, it, now there's, there's there's some sort of logarithmic. You know, there's like as as time goes by, the incremental gains uh, from one say iPhone to the next are are less. It's kind of a log logarithmic gain. It, it would it, it would appear. Um, but, in, but that means that, well, like I say, the first five or six versions, there are actually big jumps. And certainly that, would be, that is the case with Neuralink. So uh, if somebody has, say, production design version one, uh, I think five years later, they'll want to have production design version three or four. Um, and so we've designed the implant such that it can be removed um, with uh, hopefully min minimal uh, stri you know, damage to, to the area so that you can then, then but uh, replace it with another one. And, and we have with, uh, in our animal studies, we've, re we've done, I think, uh, three implants. And the third implant w still worked quite well. It, it, Meaning was, you've replaced the implant three times in a single Replaced animal. it three times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and, and, and primates, and, and, and the, the third one was still work was working great. So. So we, we've talked about the robot addressing the workforce problem. We've talked about um, scalability. Um, interchangeability. You know, a, a lot of uh, what your vision involves is being high performing, but also affordable, so it'd be accessible yes. to people. Um, how do you see uh, bridging that gap? Yeah, so um, the device itself uh, in, in volume should should not be super expensive. I mean, hopefully it's like, I don't know, five to $10,000 and, 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 and very high volume, it should start to approximate the cost of, of an Apple Watch or a a phone, so maybe it's a, a thousand or two thousand dollars, something like that. Um, and then the, if it's implanted with a robot, then that that surgical procedure sh should be fast. Um, like we, we do have a game plan for what I call the six hundred second surgery. Um, so ten, 10 minutes, you sit in the chair, and ten minutes later you have an implant. Uh, six hundred seconds, um, and we're, we're not violating physics. Um, it, so it. I mean, just, just as with LASIK, you know, it goes in a laser, does a whole bunch of things to your eyeball. Uh, you know, you'd have to automate basically everything here. Um, but it, if you break it down second by second, it is possible to have a, a 600 second or 10 minute surgery. Um, and so at that point, if it's, if it's being done by a robot and, and it's, the whole thing takes 10 minutes, um, I, I think it probably, the, the whole thing, all inclusive, ends up being you know, on the order of $5,000 maybe, Some, similar to LASIK. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you know, it's interesting, you, you invoked physics and, and, and one interesting um, insight that, that I gained in our time together is this idea that there's often um, a debate about the possible and what's possible and what's not. Yes. And um, I know you have the perspective that um, that shouldn't really be subject to debate um, because if something's um, impossible, um, yeah. it's because it's a function of physics and if not, yes. uh, then it is. And you just have to figure exactly. it out. It's, it's a, it, if, if something, if, it, like if you're breaking conservation of energy or momentum uh, or charge or something like that, then you, you either deserve a Nobel Prize or you're wrong. And most likely you're wrong. Um, so the, but if you, provided you're, you're, you're not sort of, you know, let's say during the brain surgery trying to break the sound barrier or something like that, <laughs> like you're not moving that fast, um, then that then you should come given, visit. You should come visit. I'm pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if you're if, if you're doing sonic boom, if, if the if the robot's moving so fast, it's it's creating sonic booms. Okay, that's probably that's probably going to be bad for the brain if you, if, it's, if it's going supersonic. That, that, that actually uh, is starting to make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So, but provided you're still subsonic, um, and uh, and and you're 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 not just doing things so fast that it, it, it causes physical disturbances, that then you're you're not you you can get things done very quickly, basically. Um, 
And uh, you know, I mean, you look at the things at a fine grain level and say, well, what is the, you know, uh, size of the, the voltage difference that you're trying to detect in a neuron, and and how so that like how far away from an electrode could you detect a pulse, um, you know, and and can you distinguish one neuron from another neuron based on its signature? So like if if a one neuron uh, has almost like an accent or a a voice. Um, and if, if your sensors are precise enough, you can say, okay, that, that sort of faint voice we hear, or, or that faint signal is, is this neuron, this loud signal is a nearby neuron, and you can actually figure out spatially where these neurons are yeah. um, based on, on slight differences in how they, they fire. Um, and, that, so, and that's how you're gonna map the function of the brain and, and, and get a step closer to that whole brain interface. Yeah. I mean, we definitely are venturing into deep sci-fi here. Um, if, if people are interested in some sci-fi book recommendations, I would recommend uh, Ian Banks, the culture books. Um, they, and, and Ian Banks actually does have this concept of a neural lace, uh, where there's uh, all the humans have like a neural, sort of a kind of a neural link or neural lace uh, throughout their brain. And so, and, and when, if, if, if somebody dies, they're, their, their, mem their memories are being dynamically uploaded to the, the cloud or the, whatever the internet is in the future, and they can reinstantiate into a human body if they want. Or they can live in simulation, which we might be in right now. <laughs> um, if so, I'd uh, just like to applaud the simulators on the excellent work they are doing. Yeah, th this feels very immersive and high fidelity, so thank you to our <laughs> yeah, simulator you know? yeah, I um, Yeah, I appreciate the experience. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, thank, thank you, simulators. Please don't turn us off. Yeah. Uh, and, well, uh, well, well, listen, e Elon, this, this has been a, a, a terrific um, conversation. You have all of uh, a, a neurosurgery in, in the room here. And so uh, what are uh, maybe some last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, well, I, I, I think this is going to be something that is an incredibly you know, p powerful tool uh, for neurosurgeons for um, helping uh, you know, fix things that are brain-related issues. Um, it's sort of like, um, you know, I don't know, it, it might be like the difference between, if, if it was a weapon situation, difference between like bows and arrows and jet airplanes. Like it's a big difference, <laughs> you know? So we want to give you- I, I, I hope I have the airplane <laughs> in, that, in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, in a positive, constructive way. Um, so, um, I mean, one can only do as well as the tools that one is, get, you know, if, 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 what, it's like, what tools do you have? And um, I think with, um, by, by essentially uh, giving uh, um, neurosurgeons a, a, you know, a, a much more sophisticated, powerful tool like the Neuralink device, um, it, you could really um, help a lot of people. Terrific, and I, and I know um, that's why we're all here, to, to better characterize neurologic disease and, and to help people. So really um, value your perspective. Uh, thank you for being um, our puzzle lecturer um, for creativity and innovation. Uh, Elon Musk. You're welcome, thank you, thank you everyone. It's an honor to speak, thank you.